Welcome to a special edition of our Prophecy Series. You see a different graphic on the screen because the content from tonight's message was a special message that I had the privilege to share at Amazing Facts in 2021. And you'll see the significance of that year uh, in just a moment. But the message is from a series called America's 11th Hour which, by the way, can be viewed on the Belt of Truth YouTube channel. It's, uh, in, it's called a 14-part prophecy series. 14-part prophecy series, which will bear a striking resemblance to our 16-part series that we are doing together. It's almost identical content with a little additional that we are doing here together. But to the America's 11th Hour portion of that series is sessions 11, 12, 13, and 14. So it's the last four sessions of that series is where you can hear the whole America's 11th Hour at the Belt of Truth, Scott Ritzema YouTube page. But um, the message title is The Miraculous Rise of Liberty. And this is one of my favorite messages to present. And the sad reality of this fallen world in which we live is that so much of the time when we are studying prophecy, we are having to expose deceptions and bring the light of truth of what the Bible really says. But you're always going into that whole controversy, that great controversy between Christ and Satan and revealing the deceptions that that serpent of old called the devil and Satan brings, that deceiver who deceiveth the whole world. But um, tonight, we get to see true light breaking forth. Uh, Revelation 12 is so beautiful. Revelation 12 is the story of the development of truth and what was going on with, with, with God's people during the 1,260 years of papal persecution. We're going to study it out of Revelation 12. We're going to see a woman clothed with light in just a moment. Uh, there's another woman on the screen. That's the harlot woman referred to as Babylon in Revelation. But we're not studying her tonight, but I want you to know that as we study this pure woman, this true woman, she's going to be the contrast to the false that comes later in Revelation, just like the seal of God last night came before the mark of the beast. So Revelation 12, if you'd like to turn there, we're going to be studying the entire chapter and then doing some fun history for the remainder of the time. But let's begin with prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the Sabbath, which you sanctified and made holy in Eden. Thank you for the example that you rested on it, and we may have the privilege to do the same. We thank you for the joy of salvation full and free through Jesus Christ at Calvary's cross. That redemptive act we just delight in on this day, as well as you as our creator. We love you and we want to love you more. We want to know you more. And that's what this whole study is about, for that is eternal life to know you. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> now, a great sign appeared in heaven. A woman, clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of twelve stars. That's an artist's depiction of what that woman may have look, looked like, clothed with light. Um, she's clothed. The harlot woman is going to be a different sort of character. But what does a woman represent, first of all? When you're looking at Bible prophecy and Revelation, it's a symbolic book. So what does a woman represent and what does the light represent upon her? Well, there are some texts. Some of you are saying in a church, you're exactly right. All of these texts are Bible verses that reveal this symbolism elsewhere in Scripture, where a woman represents God's bride or the wife of Jehovah. So it is God's people, Israel, or the church of God of the New Testament. Now, what is, the, what is the, the nature of this light that she bears? Remember that the harlot woman is not clothed with light. You're going to see she is the counterfeit and the false. But let's just look at the light tonight. Do you know what light represents in the Bible? Thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. And thy word is, you're saying the word. You guys jumped right to it. Truth, thy word is truth, and thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. So light represents truth, the truth of God's word specifically. Now in verses 2 and 3, we're going to see a drama unfold regarding this woman, which represents, of course, the people of God. 
whether that's Israel in the Old Testament or the church in the New Testament, both are symbolized throughout the scriptures. This, of course, is referring to the New Testament era. But at first, she is crying out in labor and in pain to give birth. Now, you're going to see who she's giving birth to. Who does, who does the people of God give birth to? That's of special note in the book of Revelation. A child who was born that had a special important part to play in redemptive history. You can probably guess, but it's going to become even more clear in a moment. Now, John then shifts scenes into heaven, seeing this, behold, a great fiery red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his heads. His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. Do you see how he shifted scenes in location and in time? Because when did that war in heaven happen? When a third of the angels fell? That was before he was the serpent in Eden in Genesis 3. So that goes way back. Now it says the dragon, so it gave some of the backstory of that dragon, and now it shows what he does with this child. The dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth, to devour her child as soon as it was born. Did he succeed at devouring her child? Read on in verse 5. She bore a male child who was to, note these words, rule all the nations with a rod of iron. Do you know of a child who was prophesied to be born who would rule all the nations with a rod of iron in the messianic language of the psalmist? That is Jesus Christ. And it'll be confirmed in a moment because, indeed, her child was caught up to God and to his throne. He was not devoured by the dragon. He was caught up to heaven to the throne of God. So, basically, you just had the whole Gospels there, the very beginning, the birth of Christ, and the very end, the ascension of Christ. And it skipped over the whole life of Christ on earth, but that is certainly the man-child being Jesus Christ. Verse 6, Then the woman... Then, so the word then means after Jesus was what? Caught up to God and to his throne in verse 5. After he was caught up to God and to his throne in verse 5, verse 6. Then the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God that they should feed her there. 1,260 days. Is that a powerful truth right there? God would not let the light-bearing church of his go extinguished any more than he would allow that baby to be devoured by the dragon, Satan. Herod tried to kill the child, as we talked about the other night, but he failed. And this dragon, Herod is personified as this dragon figure here. Satan was the one behind it, so he's the real murderer from the beginning. But this is wonderful that she was protected for how long? Well, that you've heard that time period before, haven't you? She was protected for 1,260 days at the end of verse 6. And that period extended from 538 A.D. to 1798 A.D., the exact period of papal dominance that we refer to as the Dark Ages. Now, toward the end of that period, in 1517, the Protestant Reformation began, and so there was a lot of breaking forth of light, but for the most part, she was in the wilderness. She was the persecuted church during that 1,260 years. A little more on the war in heaven is given in verses 7 and 8 and 9. We've already spent some time there, so we're now going to jump down to verse 10. Then I heard a, vo a loud voice in heaven saying, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren, Satan, that's what his name means, the accuser. That's what devil means. Who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. Is that beautiful? Is that a powerful truth right there? They overcame him. I just posted a video short, a little reel, on Facebook because I, I saw a church sign at a church that I was at with my family a couple of weeks ago. It was last week. And the church sign said, you know how people put messages on their sign out by the road? It said, there is power in Christ to overcome sin. And I said amen to that sign in my heart. But then I also realized there is some Christian theology that denies that reality and that power. 
And so I thought, what a provocative question this could be for social media. So I just pointed at the sign, and in nine seconds, because everything has to be so short these days, asked the question, is this true, or is this just a pipe dream dangled out? Can you actually overcome? The Bible says it. That it promises it. It prophesies it. That we overcome the devil by our own merits and strength? No, by the blood of the Lamb and the word of his testimony. And they love not their lives unto the death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you having great wrath, because he knows that his time is short. Verse 13, when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman. <clears throat> Which woman? The woman, the light-bearing woman. She's still around. She's been around this whole 1,260 years. This same woman who gave birth to the male child. Verse 14, but the woman was given two wings of a great eagle, restating it here, that she might fly into the wilderness to her place, where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time. Have you heard that time period before? It's sometimes referred to as 42 months. It's sometimes referred to as 1,260 days. And in this time, the case, it's a time, one year, times an unstated plurality would default to two unless otherwise specified. Time, times, and half a time, three and a half. Three and a half years in the Jewish year, 360 times three and a half is 1,260. So she is protected, it says, twice in Revelation 12. God makes sure that his church is protected during the dark ages. So here you go on, and Satan's not going to be okay with that, though. He's going to spew water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman. This is verse 15. That he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. Now here are the key words for our study tonight. But the earth helped the woman. Notice this is almost at the end of chapter 12. It's at the end of this narrative. So toward the end of the 1,260 years, Satan is doing his best to spew water after this woman because he has not been able to annihilate her light and extinguish it with his water. But the earth helps the woman. Satan is foiled again. The earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. Now let's pause right there. The earth helped the woman. You know who the woman is? It's the true church of God. What does the earth represent? Well, if you can figure out what the sea represents, the sea is the opposite of the earth, right? In Genesis, God separated the land, dry land, from the waters. And in Revelation, we already know what the sea represents. We studied it the other night. The waters which you saw, where the harlot sits, are people, multitudes, nations, and tongues. Interestingly, it's the harlot who is the contrast to the pure woman. She's on the waters. This woman is the earth. Well, the waters are a densely populated place. So the earth would represent, take a wild guess here, a place where there is more sparsely populated location. So the earth helped the woman means nothing short of a less densely populated place is of aid and assistance to the persecuted church. Now, do you remember where the uh, beast arose out of in Revelation 13? You can look at it. It's probably on the same page you're on right now. Verse 1 of chapter 13. I saw a beast rising up out of the what? The sea. And what does this beast represent? The papacy. And so is that in a densely populated place of Western Europe or a less densely, densely populated place somewhere else? So the beast arose out of Western Europe. And so the contrast to the densely populated Western European civilization, which had been civilization for a couple thousand years at that point, uh, speaking of the end of the 1,260 years, what would be the contrast to that? It would be a less densely or a more sparsely populated place. Now you just have to put your historical thinking caps on. Can you think of a place upon the earth that sometime around toward the end of the 1,260 years, at the end of the chapter 12 here, narrative of the woman, the church, can you think of a place that provided a refuge for persecuted Christians. Remember, the end of the story is 1798. And so somewhere here at the end of Revelation 12, you're going to find a place upon the earth where European Christians pre predominantly are going to be fleeing the persecution of the papacy and of Satan. 
You already know what it is, don't you? Now, what's really fun is America in prophecy appears twice in Revelation, and I'm going to keep you in suspense on the second one. This first one, though, is you just saw what you just saw. America was prophesied. It, it wasn't that there was nobody here. Of course, there were native peoples here, but not so densely populated. It was a place that opened up its arms to the people who were persecuted in the Christian faith, particularly. Um, the bicentennial happened four years before I was born. I don't remember it. Some of you may remember it. Was that a big year in American history? Huge. It was huge. I've heard. By the way, we forgot to read the last verse. <laughs> the last verse of the chapter, before we transition to the history, it says the dragon was enraged with the woman and he, make, he went to make war with the rest, the remnant of her seed. The remnant of her seed, or in the modern translations, the rest of her offspring. I really like that word remnant. We'll come back to it. Um, and this, this is the people that it's going to refer to um, after the 1,260 years here. Now at the very end, those who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. We'll come back to that. There's a whole study on just that verse and correlating, connecting verses to verse 17. But you've heard the story of the 1,260 years and the earth helped the woman. Now let's look at it in the history. In the 80s, they had, uh, the, uh, they, they had in circulation from 1976 these special quarters do you remember them? The bicentennial, bicentennial quarters. And I remember I was a little kid, and my mom, when she'd say, you've got you to keep those. When you find those, they're special. It's a bicentennial quarter. Oh, yeah, we had the bicentennial. Mommy, what does that word mean? I don't know that word. It means we were celebrating the 200th anniversary of the founding of America in 1776. By the way, have you, has anybody told you about another anniversary that's coming up in the near future in relation to 1776? Is anybody doing any math right now? She's like, no, I'm not doing math. <laughs> 2026, two years away, is going to be the 250th anniversary. Now, I told you tonight is really hopeful and enjoyable and positive, but I have to give you a sobering fact as well. You know what the average lifespan of a civilization that is a major major player upon the earth civilization is 250 years. 200. Yeah, 250, right? You know, I've heard both, 200 and 250. Um, I was actually just looking that up today. I was the like, yeah, average, average length span, lifespan for civilizations. So what I want to do is go and actually measure them myself. Um, but that's, that's anecdotal. That's what I've heard from historians. But uh, that's a whole other discussion about what's, what's happening with historical cycles going into the second half of this decade. Um, that's one indicator among many of uh, a video we're going to put out soon through Belt of Truth Ministries um, about, about 2025 and the years that follow. Uh, very, very interesting thing, things. No more time prophecies. There are no time prophecies pointing past the year 1844. But uh, just a social science analysis with prophetic indicators will be something that we'll do that will be kind of, uh, I think, intriguing to cause us to think. But um, there was another major anniversary that happened in 2020. And those of you who were alive for the bicentennial of 1776, when you told me it was, it was huge, right? Parades and after school specials, and it was the biggest thing, right? Did anybody remember three, four years ago, um, 2020, anything being made of 2020? 2020 was the 400th anniversary of the Mayflower. And I say that with a bit of indignation because I am a lover of American history and the principles of our country's founding. And I was so disappointed in just everything and everybody out there that we didn't make a bigger deal out of this. So I was trying to raise the alarm. I was like, hey, guys, it's the 14th. And nobody's listening to me in my little corner over here. But then I was at Amazing Facts. And I was there in the spring for seven deadly myths in Christianity. That was 10 parts. And I said, you guys realize that 2021 is the 400th anniversary of not the Mayflower, but of the first Thanksgiving. And did you guys do anything for 2020? No, we didn't. I'll cut them some slack. I'll cut us all some slack. We had other things on our mind in 2020, didn't we? Yeah. Okay. And I said, you realize it's the 400th anniversary, and it connects with Revelation 12, which we didn't get to in Seven Deadly Myths in Christianity. And so 
I'm willing to come back later this fall if you want to do a Thanksgiving special. I am chomping at the bit to do it somewhere. <laughs> I was asking for an invitation, and my kind hosts obliged and said, we want to have you back for that. That's why it's a 14-part series, not just a 10-part series. But I don't know about you guys. Growing up in the Christian school I went to, or maybe even in public schools 25, 35, 50 years ago, wasn't history celebrated? Um, it was taught and it was celebrated. The founding fathers and the principles of our country were recognized as good and true and valid and beautiful and the advancements of the civil rights movement. And we'd listen to Martin Luther King's speeches growing up in middle school and, and go with the, 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 the poet Langston Hughes who said, I too sing America. It was people of all races, tribes, nations, and peoples to use the revelation language that this is a pluralistic society where, any, where, where religious tolerance, freedom, liberty reigns. And that was something that I learned to love and appreciate as a kid. And then that's why I'm so bummed about 2020. And even 2021, we didn't really hear much in the media or from you know any positions of influence. Here's a dark irony for you. The first independent Protestant worship services in the New World were held in the year 1620 and when the pilgrims landed at Plymouth Rock. Fast forward 300 years to that and America takes a stand against alcoholism and says no more liquor production, sale and manufacturing use in this country. Fast forward 100 years from that and we're in the period of lockdowns the liquor stores are open and the churches are closed and locked down. What just happened in that hundred years? Something happened to take the value of religious services down in the First Amendment right down the toilet. Congress shall make no law respecting establishment of religion nor prohibit the free exercise thereof. They may not prohibit the free exercise of religion. I'm not trying to make a political statement, this party, that party. I don't care about any of that. But I love the Constitution. Every American of all backgrounds and political preferences needs to love that First Amendment. Or that's just not American. That's just not about freedom and humanity. You cannot tell people you're not allowed to worship because we said so. We've got a stay-at-home order, and your act to go out and worship together is non-essential. Non-essential. My Bible says it's essential. Story of the pilgrims. The beginnings of America were forged in faith and in sacrifice by fearless pilgrims. These pilgrims were the poor, the social outcasts of Great Britain. They were those of whom this world was not worthy. They were despised. Their worship services were illegal. Did you know that in Protestant, if you're just listening and not watching, my fingers are in the air with big fat scare quotes here. <laughs> Protestant Church of England prohibited any worship services other than that of the king, the state church. So the separatists, that was William Brewster, he was the, the lead guy of the pilgrims when they set sail on the Mayflower. He was their elder. He would lead these worship services illegally in the manor house of Scrooby, his own government building, secretly holding worship services that were not to be known by the community. The young people would be out listening as spies to conversations to see if anybody's aware of the services being held by these separatists. Separatists means we don't believe in the Church of England. We will simply have our own church. That was a radical notion at the time. We shouldn't be too hard on those of the past. Light was progressing and moving forward, but thanks to these guys, it was moving forward faster. William Bradford was the young, one of the young people under Elder Brewster's congregation. We'll come back to William Bradford in just a second. But the pilgrims, as we now call them, became pilgrims because worshiping illegally and have, getting arrested periodically and being under the, the nose and under the thumb of this oppressive government and church in England was not a long-term plan for these guys. They said, we're going to escape to a free country called Holland the Netherlands. And I have a special affinity for that place because it happens to be my background heritage from my ancestors, but interestingly also French, and I'll come back to that with the Huguenots in just a minute. But here's the irony of the pilgrims though. 
the pilgrims end up not wanting to stay in the Netherlands, in Leiden. They're, they're in the city here. They're making very few Dutch converts. Their children are becoming absorbed in Dutch life, and they're not retaining their English separatist Christian heritage that they're trying to build for this community. And so they said, we don't think this is a long-term plan to stay in the Netherlands. So that we don't really like these Dutch people all that much in their worldly culture. We've got to make plans to get out of here. And where shall we go? Well, their pastor, John Robinson, in the Netherlands, was a, a wonderfully uh, uh, well, well studied in the scriptures pastor. And we're going to come back to him in a future session. You're going to hear more about him. But he, as well as William Bradford now, who's a young man and stepped up as not just a youth out in the streets, but they've been here for, a, for a 12 years now in Leiden. And William Bradford steps up in front of the group when they're all discussing, should we go to the, un, the, to the, uh, the untamed wilderness of America? across the ocean. We've heard about those Jamestown colonists that went there in 1608, and word is that the American wilderness is one of much danger and trepidation. Two-headed two -headed snakes, saber-toothed tigers, and cannibals that will boil you alive. And so there was all this misinformation about, I mean, it's not, a, not a, exactly an easy place to come to, but there were certainly some hyped fears. And this is what they were facing. Really? Are we going to sell our property and rent a ship and, and be a part of a, a company that can establish a colony under the king's permission? And they, they, were, they, were, they were hesitant. But you know what? They hold a day of prayer and fasting and to hold a vote on the matter as a congregation. Should this scrooby turned Leiden separatist congregation become who we know as the pilgrims to America on the Mayflower? There's a statement that William Bradford states, which is basically, all great difficulties are to be overcome by answerable courages. In other words, the challenges before us have to be met with proportional faith and courage and he inspires them, and they vote, and it comes back in the affirmative. Probably my favorite history book, it's also history and prophecy, it's called The Great Controversy. It says that when God's hand seemed pointing them across the sea to a land where they might found for themselves a state and leave to their children the precious heritage of religious liberty, they went forward without shrinking in the path of providence. I love that last word, providence, because prophecy without providence wouldn't be prophecy. It would never get fulfilled if it wasn't for God's hand of prophecy, providence rather, directing human events. And when in the course of human events, this decision arises, the cour courageous, the bold, the faithful, these few and despised pilgrims went forward in the path of providence to obey God's calling across the sea. They knew it was God's leading. This is the famous painting of Pastor John Robinson bidding the pilgrims farewell because he didn't go across. He maintained the congregation in Leiden. Not all of them left. And he never got to join them. He died five years later in 1625. He's been called the most important pilgrim who never made the pilgrimage. And again, I'll come back to him another time. 102 passengers board the ship the Mayflower. I'm skipping the Speedwell and how they're in danger of getting put in prison again. I'm, there's a lot of details in the full seminar of this at my YouTube channel, so I'll just get right to it. Do you know that of 102 passengers, 30 of these are children? Uh, 51 are the pilgrims, 51 are the strangers. The people were not of the pilgrims' congregation. And so the majority of the pilgrims are children and youth. It's a cargo ship. It's not a... Um, it's not a it's not a passenger liner, you know. This is 1620, and these are poor people. And it was 1617 that they made the decision to, to, to go. It took them a full three years to raise enough funds and get the, get the organization ready to go. And I should mention something right now. Remember that year, 1617, that it was in 1617 that God's finger said, Go. In 1617, we're going to come back to that. Now, to say it's a cargo ship, has anybody been to the Mayflower 2, by the way? Mayflower 2, it's a modern uh, rebuilding of the Mayflower in Plymouth. 
Massachusetts. We were just there as a family this September. And I'm walking around like this, and the guy's like, well, yeah, they made us give you eight extra inches for insurance purposes. Imagine it's down even further. And uh, so it was not comfortable under a uh, below deck. By the way, nothing compared to the transatlantic slave trade where these human beings dehumanized as chattel were put packed in like sardines and mistreated like no human being should be treated. But back to the pilgrim story, they had to be below deck so much of the time because of the storm and because of the crew needing to man the upper deck and not have all these young people and their families running around. And they would kneel in prayer and sing their hymns morning and evening. And when they listened to those Bible stories of God's providence on the troubled seas and and through the water of the Red Sea, and through the water of the Jordan, and Paul, the Apostle Paul on the, on the, on the Mediterranean, as the threatening autumn winds blew, and the gale force uh, winds almost destroyed that ship, literally. William Bradford, in his historical account of the pilgrims called Of Plymouth Plantation, he says the ship was wickedly shaken. I asked the curators of the Mayflower too, show me the main beam that would have cracked. And he says, well, there are four main beams. One of the four did indeed crack. There was a screw that was just this thing they needed. It was to be a jack later for building roofs for their colony. And that screw was able to be put in and repair that ship so it didn't fall apart completely and leave them all dead. Wickedly shaken indeed, the serpent of old spewing water, literally in this case, I guess, to try to destroy this element of that church of God called the woman. Singing the Psalms received not only encouragement in their hearts, inspired not only encouragement in, the, in their congregation, but also the, dis, the, 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 the evil of the, the worldly ship crew. They said, we do not want to hear that. We, they, they would ridicule them. They threatened to throw them overboard, and they did not get along at that point. But interestingly, one of only two people who fell overboard was the very man who threatened to throw them overboard. So after that, the rest of the crew was like, you know what, we're going to be a little nicer to these guys. And I'm not saying that was God's judgment, but they might have seen it that way. <laughs> Nonetheless, there was a boy who was thrown overboard, and he didn't perish. Um, he, he was, his name was John Howland, and at the moment he fell in the water, there just happened to be a line from the ship hanging right there that he grabbed onto, and they pulled him back aboard. And two million people descend from John Holland. Two million people. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Including two US, three U.S. presidents, and Henry Wadsworth Longfellow and Ralph Waldo Emerson, famous American literary figures. I find that to be interesting. By the way, there are 34 million people alive on earth that descend from these 51 pilgrims. Or from these 100, sorry, not, from, not just from the 51. i got to get to 51 in just a minute. There's another 51 coming. From the 102 passengers, 34 million people. And I'm not one of them. Um, does anybody happen to know that they're one of them? There's one. In a, in a, in a room of 100, you know, my, my average you know, audience is 100 or so, and there'll always be one. And I was wondering, you know, this is a smaller crowd. Maybe there will, maybe there won't. Mayflower descended. Huh? Do you know their names? Hutchinson. Hutchinson, all right. You, you have descendant back to the Mayflower, too? That's incredible. Oh, that's so cool. Um, I have one from the slave ship. Yeah, yeah, seriously. <laughs> we got a lot of folks that descend from that period. Oh. Um, do you find it ironic, by the way, though, that I don't like... It, everybody's got their own unique story, so I don't mean to just dwell on mine like it's special. I just happen to have the podium. But I find it ironic that the guy who's of the culture that the pilgrims wanted to get away from is the one that's like, yeah, we love the pilgrims, right? It really goes back to uh, Langston Hughes. I learned his poem. I memorized his poem, The Black Poet in America in the 1920s, and it was called I Too Sing America. Even people from the Netherlands who the pilgrims didn't want to be around anymore could say, yeah, these guys had something right. This was God's movement. And so it doesn't matter if you're Anglican, and they, you know, they were at odds with the Anglicans. If you're Native American, although they did get along, they got along with the Native Americans uh, in these early decades. We'll get to that in just a minute. But I love this story because it brings people together. We have enough hate and division in our society. 
along whatever lines we human beings seem to create, that God's like, no, no, it's every nation, tribe, people, and language with palm branches singing the same song in Revelation 7. They have the same seal of God in their foreheads. He doesn't see those divisions. So um, after nine weeks on the wild autumn Atlantic, land was overdue. When they spotted land, they sang like they'd never sung before, and they said, long-awaited Virginia, our fertile land. Wait a minute, that's not Virginia. We're in the wrong place. <laughs> Head due south, they said. Well, they approached the deadly shoals of the New England coast upon which if this ship gets dashed and gets destroyed, they all perish in those icy waters and upon those rocks. They're there. They've arrived, and they haven't. And now they're in about the greatest danger of the whole trip. So what do we do? Head due south? No, we can't, because that will be our death. <laughs> the wind is not allowing them to go south. Is this a coincidence? The wind, we'll get back to the wind. We'll, get, we'll, we'll touch on the wind in a little bit. The worldly ship captain says, pray as you've never prayed before. And they certainly did. And a miraculous wind out of the south pulls them out from the danger of the rocks. And they realize this is Providence saying, you're going here, Providence Town Harbor. They interpreted that as God's leading that they would establish their colony there. Um, now there's a mutiny aboard the ship, though, because this isn't Virginia. We don't have to obey anymore. <laughs> the captain, we're not under your, your uh, rule. So the Mayflower Compact is formed. This is a historic document. And why is this an historic document? It is because it is the first time in, in known history that a simple group of people without any kings or any popes, I guess you could say God leading Israel in the Old Testament under his uh, theocratic uh, government, but this is the first time that human beings have simply said, we don't need church authority and royal monarchical authority or Caesars or emperors or pharaohs or anybody. We're going to form our own civil body politic. It was the forerunner to a certain document you might know that begins with the three words, we the people, the U.S. Constitution, Mayflower Compact. And under this compact, everybody was, whether they were of the pilgrims' faith or not, as John Robinson taught them, he said, tolerate those who are not of your faith. Now, what you know about the Puritans in Massachusetts is probably not that. We'll get to that. But these, these separatists are of a different group, and they did have quite a bit of pro progressive, if you will, light on this matter of religious toleration. But we'll come back to that question in a little bit, because we're going to do a little constitutional history uh, toward the end. But I told you that you need to remember the year 1617. Do you know what was going on in 1617 in New England? And the pilgrims would have known nothing of this, of course. There was nothing happening in New England. I mean, maybe some of the Virginia colonists would be coming up there to fish and then go back down. Uh, there was, there was some, some English uh, traversing, but there was no established, established colony in New England. There was, there was, however, in 1617, a deadly, devastating plague that was decimating the native tribes, particularly those that had a more warlike, aggressive posture toward English colonists. And... The, the Indians that survived were the Wampanoags that had a more peaceful, agreeable, uh, friendly uh, acceptance of English colonists. And though, right where they landed is where the warlike uh, native tribes had, been, had, been, had died off, and the rest of the Wampanoags said, we don't want to be there because that land has a curse. So now you have cleared land. You have a friendly tribe that's at a distance that's like, oh, yeah, yeah, please. <laughs> oh, and you want to buy it from us? Yes. So it went well. It was God's providence leading to this, this, um, this friendship. And it was indeed a friendship because they're at, their morning, they're at their morning worship and in walks a man called Samoset and he just starts, he opens their door after they had built a, built a, a, a meeting house and uh, he speaks English to them and immediately they're, they're, they make a friend and just a, a little bit later, he brings his friend Squanto over. And you know the name Squanto because he taught them how to farm this unforgiving soil in New England. Three sisters farming, country living at its most rugged. But um, I'm getting ahead of myself because we were just in the harbor and we had not gotten to the deadly winter 
1620 into 1621. They, they arrived in the fall, and they're living on the ship, and their provisions are low, and they're dying. They're dying of scurvy. There, there's a point where to have anybody not dying during a week is a shock. 102 dropping off like flies week after week. 51 members of that Mayflower survived that winter. Half of them died. Now, here's an interesting statistical fact. Of the mothers aboard the ship, there were 18 mothers. How many statistically would you expect to die then of the 18? Nine. 14 of the mothers died. Why do you think that is? They were giving their food to their children. And they, have a, they brag about the fact that they honor women at the, at the uh, Plymouth Museum. They say we're the only place we know of that has two um, historical statues to, to women. And there's a, there's a chapter in the book, The Great Controversy, called The Pilgrim Fathers. And I think that's great. I, I, I love it. But I got to throw some attention to the Pilgrim Mothers. Because without them, those children wouldn't have survived. And there wouldn't be 34 million people. What would have happened to this colony if there weren't children to carry on that faith? But the story is so beautiful because that friendship lasted for decades. Eventually, the Pilgrim colony of separatists gets subsumed into Massachusetts Bay colony of Puritans. And you end up with King Philip's War. And then you end up with a, a lot of strife between European or eventually American and, and Native and, and the, the death and destruction that happens there and the war, the, the brutality back and forth, sadly. But um, what Edward Winslow, the, the pilgrim, said was, where there is true love, there is no fear. So these are just people. And, you know, people go to the stories of, you know, the pilgrims found corn buried in the ground, and they're like, a cache of corn. This is helping us survive over the, over the winter. And who, what Native Americans does this belong to, we don't know. And there's nobody around that we can talk to. They take the corn. Oh, you evil, oppressive thieves and stuff. But you know what they said? They said, we're going to make them large satisfaction. We're going to pay back more than what we took here for survival temporarily. And our first order of business is going to figure out whose that was and who we owe. Now, you might not do the same because maybe your conscience wouldn't allow you to do that. You'd wait for the ravens to come. But they made that choice with a much higher degree of validating that savage. I did that in big quotes if you're listening and not seeing. They recognize these as their fellow man. To, have, to buy every, every square foot of property needed to go personally through the chief Massasoit himself of the Wampanoags. William Bradford insisted on that. Now, these were not perfect people but they certainly weren't running around with smallpox blankets and being the conquistadores and, and putting into slavery the, uh, the native peoples here. So you can't paint with a broad brushstroke throughout history. Yeah. And everything that comes from, from Europe has that taint to it. These pilgrims had some integrity. And I can't say I'm an any better of a person than they were. Um, Edward Winslow was also a missionary to the natives. He said he, um, he, he was visiting them and he would bow his head in prayer before the meal was served to him. And they asked him, why do you do that? And he said, well, I'm thanking the creator God who's given us this food. And they found common ground and said, we understand there is a creator as well. And they understood things a little differently because he says they listened greatly to God's works of creation and preservation, his laws and ordinances, especially the Ten Commandments. Ah, very interesting. Wasn't that the last verse in Revelation 12, 17? Something about the commandments coming in the last days. All of which they hearkened unto with great attention and liked well of. They didn't really like the seventh commandment, though, the one about adultery. He says that they wanted their, their multiple wives and stuff. But during a drought, the pilgrims and Indians uh, fasted and prayed together that God would send rain. Everybody was worried in the region. But God sent rain, and the Indians said it was the best harvest that they'd ever had. And that's what led to the Thanksgiving feast that you know about of that year. Now, um... You've heard of justice. Justice is a word that's used a lot these days. Um, there, was, there were two matters. We'll get to another in just a second. Um, there was a Wampanoag Indian who was killed by two uh, colonists that had come and joined the, the, the Plymouth Colony, as it became known, Plymouth, Plymouth Plantation, Plymouth Colony. And 
the, the, the Wampanoags were looking at that going, oh, well, no justice is going to be happening here because that's not how they deal with us. And the judge of the Plymouth Colony named John Jenny, he tried these, these two colonists of his own colony for murdering somebody of a foreign nation and said, you are guilty, and they were hung. Um, so they, they meted out justice in that context for murder. Now, another matter of justice was the common store economy. This was 150 years before Adam Smith's The Wealth of Nations and the understanding of free market trade and the division of labor. Sorry if that was economics jargon to you. The division of labor means you specialize in what you do and you become more productive because you're specializing and then trade occurs. So labor is divided and specialized to a certain extent. Well, here they had just kind of like the common store is available for everybody and just work how much you want to work and contribute from what you, it's like from each according to his ability to each according to his need. Maybe you've heard that somewhere from Karl Marx. But um, this was, uh, you know, a, 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 not, a, not a communist setting, but it also did not incentivize labor. And so William Bradford's watching people slack off, you know, able-bodied men. We're not talking about caring for the elderly and, and stuff like that. But he said, we're scrapping the common store we're going to land ownership, and you gotta, you gotta pull yourself up by your bootstraps, because we're gonna get busy here. If a man does not work, he shall not eat, the Bible says. So he kind of cracked the whip, and all of a sudden people were incentivized because they wanted to eat. And production tripled. It was like the greatest GDP growth in American history in the years following that. I think that was uh, 2024, uh, 1624, but nonetheless, uh, or, yeah, 1623 was the year. Um, and that's stated in the great controversy that as the tidings spread through the countries of Europe of a land where every man might enjoy the fruit of his own labor, thousands flocked to the shores of the new world. And there's no sin in that. There is a sin in greed. There is a sin in not remembering the needy. There is a sin in withholding your tithe, which is God's, and it's robbing God. There is sin involving that. But the freedom to enjoy the fruit of your own labor is, is part of God's universe of freedom. And so that's a beautiful thing that attracted people to this place. So they're not a part of a feudal system. They're not serfs on, a, on, a, on, on somebody else's land. You can own your own land. You can enjoy the fruits of your own labor. But even more importantly, why would people come? Because the earth helped the woman. This is a place, America, speaking now more broadly of 1620 through 1776 and beyond. This is a place where you can come and worship according to the dictates of your own conscience. And of course, it was not perfect. And of course, not all people I even had freedom in those decades leading up to the revolution and until 1861. But progress continued. Progress continued. And the hope of, and the promise of these principles became more and more actualized as time went on. Now, by the 1700s, some amazing miracles happened. You saw the hand of providence in the pilgrims. But let's move past the pilgrims and jump forward about 100 years to the 1740s. You got a war between Britain and France now, and you got all these British colonies. You know about our colonies? They the 13 states that founded our country. They were British colonies. Now, does prophecy have an interest in making sure that the Protestant British colonies do not fall to Roman Catholic France? If it's the earth to help out the woman from papal persecution, then prophecy certainly has an interest in making sure the American colonies don't fall to papal France. Well. Um, Louisburg, which was a British colony, uh, or was a, which was a French colony, fell to the British in 1745. So the Protestant nation of the Protestant British are gaining territory on the eastern seaboard. But France then attempts to reconquer Louisburg, and while they're at it, take Boston, which was one of the most important, if not the most important, of the British uh, um, coastal ports, port cities. Well, France sends 73 ships, 800 cannons, 13,000 troops. This is a big assault, naval assault, on, and land. And on October 16, 1746, Reverend Thomas Prince, a Boston minister, prays this prayer. Send thy tempest, Lord, upon the waters. Scare the, scatter the ships of our tormentors. And indeed, that's exactly what happened. America was to be a haven for the Protestant faith especially and for Catholics who want to feel that, flee that oppression as well but it was not to be under papal dominion. So what happened to the French Navy? Soon after this prayer, the sky darkened, the winds shrieked, a hurricane scattered the French fleet as far as the Caribbean. Lightning struck, exploding powder kegs and ships. Wow, it was dramatic. 
Can I fast forward a couple generations to another major storm in American history? Speaking of storms, you read about these kind of things in the Old Testament. And this is not to say, by the way, that the British Empire is God's new Israel, you know, the Constantinian view. Don't go there, please. This is just God intervening, which he does. It's not baptizing the British Empire. And in this case, the American government, the War of 1812. This isn't baptizing American militarism either. But God did have an interest in prophecy in preserving the free states of America in the War of 1812. The British said, we're coming to get our colonies back. War of 1812, from British impressment, Napoleonic Wars, there's a lot of background about why we ended up at war with the British since 1812. I won't bore you with the details, but basically they set the White House on fire and other buildings in Washington, D.C. on fire. And their, their troops were looking like this, they were about to overtake. I mean, this was like we, we were going to be overrun by the British and lose our American independence. All of a sudden, a great storm and a fierce tornado arose and fell upon the British, killing many of their soldiers. It's like the Lord shall fight for you and you shall hold your peace. The British fled the city. Torrential rains for hours extinguished the fires. And the British had to make it out of the city through mud and down trees. And their two ships were run aground. Others had damaged rigging. Two of the ships had, had run aground because of the storm. The British Navy was also outside Baltimore at the same time, roughly bombarding the city. You probably heard something called the Star Spangled Banner and the bombs bursting in air. That's where this comes from. And they had a whole load of cannonballs, 1,800 of them. It was no contest. The Americans are going to be totally decimated, except the storm that had ravaged the British in Washington, D.C. turns south toward Baltimore, turning everything into mud, and the cannonballs land not with an explosion, but with a thud in so many cases. And the flag was still there, Francis Scott Key wrote in the famous words of the Star Spangled Banner. Let's return now to the period leading up to the War for Independence. This is again Britain versus France, the Seven Years' War. And again, France wants to overtake the British colonial possessions and establish North America as a papal dominion. This time, 22-year-old British colonel, you may know his name, George Washington, is in a battle with the French. This is also known as the French and Indian War, if you remember your American history textbook. Well, Washington's people, the British, are being annihilated by the French in this battle. And George Washington was literally the only officer who survived. This was one battle that the, that the Protestant side, if you will, did lose, but um, George Washington survived. Did prophecy maybe have an interest in preserving the life of this important founder of America? And here's his own words on the matter. He says, I have been protected beyond all human probability or expectation, for I had four bullets through my coat and two horses shot under me, yet escaped unhurt, although death was leveling my companions on every side of me. Does this sound a little bit like the Desmond Doss story to you? Yeah. Like, how those all, how'd all those bullets miss him? <laughs> that's, that's not possible. He had several bullets, four bullets, through his coat that didn't touch his skin. What ratio of, of, of a person standing there like that is coat versus human flesh behind the coat? I mean, it's like, what, 3% coat hanging? How did four bullets hit that and not the man? Unbelievable. <laughs> yeah. Bullets were diverted from his body. A similar bullet story happens later in American history when an important president, Andrew Jackson, had an assailant to come up to him with not one but two pistols. Bang, bang, but no bang. They both misfired. Both of them misfired. This is the 1830s. They got pretty good guns by then. He says, a kind of providence has been pleased to shield me against the recent attempt upon my life and irresistibly carried my mind to the belief in a superintending providence. These, these civic men who weren't noted for their religiosity recognized God's hand of providence. How much more can we? Back in the 1620, the pilgrims also had their coats shot through. William Bradford said they had this barricade with their coats and all the arrows from an Indian attack were coming upon them and not one of those arrows hit them. Now back to the miracle stories, a cluster of them during the War for Independence, George Washington and his his colonial army. The first naval engagement of the, of the war was the Battle of Bunker Hill in 1775. The British Navy was the most powerful navy in the world at this time. And the ragtag colonial army is no contest for the strongest military power on the globe. 
the British Empire, upon which eventually the sun never set. Historians say it was a coincidence, a coincidence, that this important opening battle had this noted feature. The British ships were stocked with the wrong size cannonballs. Whoops! We're the most competent military in the world, but, but our ball doesn't match the, the, the cannon. Uh, so they couldn't bombard the American position in the city of Boston. And so um, 2,300 British soldiers disembarked and charged the hill. That's why it's called the Battle of Bunker Hill, not the Battle of Getting Annihilated and Having Boston Destroyed. That would be a laborious title to give it anyway, so I'm glad it's called the Battle of, Battle of Bunker Hill. The British suffered twice as many casualties as the Americans because of their needing to go into army mode rather than navy mode. Another time of the war, the British held siege against the colonists in Boston, starving out the inhabitants. This was a brutal war, all war. War is brutal. War is not something that is pleasing to God. Satan loves it. He loves death. British General Howe planned 3,000 troops to, darge, to charge what's called Dorchester Heights at Boston, and he's, he's about to really overtake them. And, but just like what happened later in the War of 1812, a violent storm caused turbulent seas, and the British were not able to land their 3,000 troops. Washington says that this most remarkable interposition of providence is for some wise purpose, I have no doubt. He didn't know this prophecy of Revelation 12. He didn't know what the earth is and that the earth helps the woman. But he knew prophecy, providence rather, he knew providence was doing this for some wise purpose. We know because it's going to lead to verse 17, which is going to be the climax of Revelation 13 and 14 with the three angels' messages going up against the mark of the beast. New York was the next target for the British. They planned the largest invasion, land invasion in human history. They're like, enough of these American colonists. We will send overwhelming force. We are a thousand times more powerful them than them. Let's go get them. A thousand. Hyperbole there. I don't know the exact number to quantify it, but here's what they do. 32,000 troops are going to disembark the ships to overtake the Americans at, in New York. Washington said at this time, we are not in men or in arms prepared for it, but providence will go on to afford us aid. The date is July 9, 1776. The Declaration of Independence has been written and signed five days earlier on July 4, written before, signed, finalized by July 4. A copy of the Declaration of Independence is brought to these fearful but courageous troops and they hear the following words as part of the Declaration of Independence. With a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. They trusted and believed in divine providence. They didn't know the prophecies. Many of the founding fathers didn't even have what you'd call fundamental Bible-believing views of, of deity, of Christ's nature, of Christ's atonement, of, uh, of these things. But they knew that they were swept up in something big, something providential. And many of them were, were Christians that had come out of that great awakening as well during the 1700s and the decades previous to the, the, uh, the Declaration of Independence. But um, here's what happens. 10,000 British troops are landed elsewhere and come from behind the Continental Army at the, to trap them between the force coming from the sea and the force coming from behind them at the land. They are toast. They have to retreat. That's all they can do. An urgent retreat across the East River is needed. Now, the East River, the waters of which are notably calm, contrasts with that out in the harbor where it's being whipped up in another frenzy where the British ships are. And so the miraculous retreat happens as such. They have enough boats just to go back and forth, ferrying people across the river one boat at a time. It's going to take hours. But what, guess what happens? They're doing it in the night where the British are not staging any attacks. But they only get half the troops, the Continental Army, across the river in the night. The other half are now going to be sitting ducks. Except a very dense fog seemed to settle in a peculiar manner over both encampments. I could scarcely discern a man at six yards. So they were able to complete the, uh, the, the escape, the, the retreat across the river. And the British never again after this had a chance to capture the entire Continental Army all at once. Final battle, it's not the final battle, but it's known as the, the turning point in the war. It's the final one we will look at. It's the Battle of Saratoga. So one of the most important battles in world history uh, because it turned the tide of the war and per persuaded the French, here we go, you got Catholic France now on 
the colonial side. So this is, that's certainly not Constantine's army, so there's a little additional point there. But the Battle of Saratoga, it, uh, it was quoting Elihu Yale at the time. He said this about why the Continental Army was able to gain victory. To whom but the ruler of the winds shall we ascribe it that the British reinforcement in the summer of 1777 was delayed on the ocean three months by contrary winds until it was too late. The ruler of the winds, indeed. Jesus, we know him as the one upon the sea of Galilee who told the winds to be calm. In this case, the winds were told to do something else, to keep the British at bay, and then the French are able to come in and join the, the American side. George Washington called it a signal stroke of providence. You just have to pause sometimes and be thankful for those who sacrifice so much. Because as I think about the, the Americans who did become captive to the British Army, they were put on starving ships. Do you know what that is? It's just what it sounds like. They were put on ships to just be held there to starve to death. That's it. Um, inhumane beyond description. 11,000 Americans died on the British starving ships. That's a 90% casualty rate of those who were put on the ships. And that's more than died in battle. And many of them froze at Valley Forge to death. 2,500 froze to death. So when you have starving ships and freezing to death, it's like wounds and death from battle are small compared to this. And Valley Forge is so inspiring because it was people from different faith backgrounds, from different states, even from Maryland, even from Pennsylvania, Quakers, Catholics, Anglicans, Congregationalists, or Puritans, and even Native Americans, blacks in some cases, kids age 12 up to seniors, as we might call them, age 60. Final act in defeat of the, of the war was the Battle of Cowpens. I won't tell you about the battle. It's the retreat that follows, or the retreat that counts. Um, General Cornwallis of the British pursued the Continental Army after this battle. They were some distance behind, perhaps two hours distance. The Americans crossed the Catawba River. Right after they are, they are able to get across the river, it just so happens that a sudden storm causes the Catawba River to rise substantially, delaying the British to get across that same river that the colonists had. And then it happens again. At the Dan River, the Americans get across, the storm comes, the river rises, and the British are like, really, again? British commander Henry Clinton says, here the Royal Army was again stopped by a sudden rise of the waters which had only just fallen almost miraculously to let the enemy over. He can't help but say it. It seems like there are miracles preventing the British from subduing these people. That's why George Washington summed it up and said, we have abundant reason to thank Providence for its many favorable interpositions on our behalf. It has at times been my only dependence, for all other resources seem to have failed us. The arm of flesh will fail you. You dare not trust your own. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. That's our, that's our anthem for the war against, against Satan, against deception. We don't wage war as the world does, the Bible says. Do you know that text? The, battle, the, war, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. So I don't tell the stories of the wars to hype us into that mindset whatsoever. <laughs> Onward, Christian soldiers is metaphoric, we understand, right? <laughs> so the U.S. Constitution, 1787, I love what George Washington says. He's like, how did we get this thing ratified? It is little short of a miracle that you have delegates, delegates from so many different states that all have such different manners and circumstances and prejudices that they would unite in forming a system of national government so little liable to well-founded objections. Wow, the states came together and formed a more perfect union than the Articles of Confederation had established. That was the first constitution we had till 1787, the U.S. Constitution at Philadelphia. It's been called the Miracle at Philadelphia. It's a great title of a book. James Madison said the real wonder is that so many difficulties should been, have been surmounted. I mean, what do you do with slave populations and the apportionment, apportionment of Congress, congressional seats in the House of Representatives? What do you do with the fact that Virginia is a big state and they want proportional representation in Congress and um, Rhode Island, or, or pick your small state, is a small state and they want equal representation in Congress? There were so many debates that you never thought would have been sorted out 
and as unprecedented, it says, it is impossible for any man of candor to reflect on this circumstance without partaking of the astonishment. It is impossible for the man of pious reflection not to perceive in it a finger of that almighty hand which had been so frequently and signally extended to our relief in the critical stages of the revolution. So just like Providence helped us in our revolution against the British, so also Providence helped us in forming this constitution. Because what does it say in this constitution? And by the way, it eventually would say, and oh, if it just could have early on too, but it eventually would say in the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments that all people of all races have freedom to be citizens and the rights of citizenship and the right to vote, which was not extended in all states until the Civil Rights Movement, the Voting Rights Act of 1863 and the Civil Rights Act of 1865. Let's reverse those dates. But anyway, that took some time. Uh, the right for women, women to vote took some time. Um, black men had the right to vote before women did in America. Did you know that? Yeah. Um, so some of these things took some time. These were products of their time. But this was the most giant leap forward of progress that you had seen since the Protestant Reformation of 1517. And, uh, and, and these guys were not, you know, as I said, fundamental Bible-believing Christians for the most part. When you look at Madison, Adams, Jefferson, even Washington, this, they did not form, I, I want to I look at what did they form. What Did they create a nation that was to now enforce a different variation of Protestantism like England did? Um, it, you know, do you come out, of, come out of the Antichrist system, which enforced Catholicism, do you come out of that to enforce Protestantism? Or, or do you say, wait a minute, we shouldn't be enforcing religion. It should be an individual choice to worship God. Not even God forces religion. So that's why that First Amendment is so important. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. So we don't go around establishing one religion over another. Nor shall we prohibit the free exercise of religion. You may freely exercise your religion in America with no interference. Neither shall there be a state religion imposed upon people. It's total freedom of religion. Isn't that beautiful? Yes, it is. And Jesus put this out there in Matthew 20. He said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles, so the, the pagans, those who are not of what I'm teaching you, they, their rulers, lord it over them. And those who are great at the exer exercise authority over them, power over he says, yet it shall not be so among you, but whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. That's the kingdom of God. It's not one of power over. He was the one who got down on his knees and washed feet and went to the cross. And he said, now go and do thou likewise. So what makes America exceptional, distinct, and different? And yes, I use that word exceptional. In my history degree at, you know, the universities and their agenda, oh, American exceptionalism, they had such a good time scoffing at that notion. And then I kind of studied on my own and went, wait a minute, I know not everything the, the, that American governmental officials have done for 250 years is awesome, obviously, but are, isn't there something exceptional about There must be something exceptional about America, and I didn't even know the prophecies. I just knew that millions of people for 200 years have wanted to get here. So there's got to be something unique, exceptional, different about it. People of all backgrounds. Nobody's like, oh, my background isn't welcome there. I'm not going to America. Muslims want to come to America. Africans want to come to America. Everybody wants to come to America. There must be something unique and exceptional. And it's not just the prosperity of the post-World War II era, because this has been going on for 200 years. And we were not the most uh, advanced economically in the world. The British and the European industrial revolutions were 50 years ahead of ours. So what was it? Well, you heard it in the quote on the Great Controversy. It is that economic freedom. We didn't have a feudal system. But also the freedom to respect the dignity of the individual conscience. That you can live as you know you need to live in the sight of God. And unfortunately, people abuse that. And if they're thieves and murderers, they go to jail in America. It's not anarchy here. But... As far as religious choice goes, that 
is the province of the individual conscience. And we've been going on this point pretty heavily the last few minutes, that it's, it's not a nation that enforces religious observances. But also, we've got to go to this right now. The Constitution did not enforce an atheistic nation either, did it? It said you can't prohibit people's free exercise. And in the Declaration of Independence itself, it says our rights come to us from the Creator. And it doesn't say now you must take a doctrinal oath as you know, a Christian member of this church to hold office. The Constitution says you may not have a religious test for holding office. And at the same time, it doesn't put the state as God. Did you hear those words? That was key. The reason the Declaration of Independence needs to say our rights are endowed by our Creator is because if you remove the Creator and in unalienable human rights from the equation, then our rights just become privileges dispensed by the state. This is how it works in communist nations that said religion is the opiate of the masses and religion is the cause of all of the terrible problems of the Dark Ages. Well, a false religion is the cause of all those problems. But the communists and the French Revolution threw the baby out with the bathwater. And they denied God entirely, unlike our founding fathers, who neither enforced nor denied God. Do you see the tightrope? There's a tightrope of with tyranny on either side. Religious oppression or secular domination a la communism or the French Revolution. The papal model, which Protestants can play a good papal game too, or that atheistic regime, which you don't want to be anywhere near. Both of these led to hundreds of millions of people dead. Uh, just in Mao's China, upwards of 100 million. Not to mention Stalin and Hitler and all of these genocidal maniacs of the 20th century. Do you know about the French Revolution? I won't give you the whole history because we're way over time, but it's an interesting one. The, basically, the French Revolution was we're so tired of the oppressive religious power, we're just going to throw all religion off and, um, because France never accepted the Protestant Reformation. When the Dark Ages Church was persecuting John Calvin and others attempting a reformation in France, and they engaged in the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre and killed tens of millions of people, uh, the French Huguenots fled for the free nation of the Netherlands. And I was mentioning I've got some French Huguenot blood personally because the Netherlands and the, Fr the French who moved to the Netherlands intermarried with the Dutch. The Dutch really, the Netherlands really was the freest nation at that time, that and, and certain places in Switzerland. So that was, a, that was a great haven, earth helping out the woman in its own way there. But this was brutal. They deified reason. They ended up with Robespierre's reign of terror. And I'm just skipping the history a little bit because we're, we've got to be wrapping up here. But I do like that in The Great Controversy, it quotes that grand old document, which our forefathers set forth as their Bill of Rights, the Declaration of Independence. And they declared, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So the American Republic, founded by Protestants, acknowledges the Creator. It says no enforcement of religion and no restricting freedom of conscience. And therefore, ha ha ha, the rest of our prophecy here, it was America, not atheistic France, certainly not the Vatican, that became the wellspring of the 19th century missionary work and the Bible societies. And one more bullet point here, that I will tell you about in a few nights that I'm going to leave you in suspense on. That is the rest of Revelation 12, the very last verse of Revelation 12. The movement comes out of, the, out, out of America to go global. So um, there were some other toleration of minority religions. I got to give a nod to the uh, Anabaptists from where we get uh, the Mennonites and the Amish and the, uh, the uh, Hutterites. Um, they, 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 in the 1500s, were saying, we are the church, we should not be wedded with the state. We are, we are a separate thing, and, and we don't seek the sword and power over others like Constantine did. Christianity went wrong at Constantine, went off the mark, and these were very principled people. Uh, they also engaged in the proper baptism, because uh, the Lutheran and Calvinist teachings of the time, of most of the Reformation in Europe, was under Luther or Calvin, Calvin and Zwingli, 
and England had its own, um, but, but of, of mainland Europe, it was mainly Luther and Calvin. And the Mennonites said, you realize you're not baptizing, you're sprinkling that baby. And that's not baptism. Baptism means to be immersed. And in the Bible, baptism happens when you've repented. And the baby hasn't repented. And so they established uh, a doctrine that has, has been accepted by much of Christianity today, not just the Mennonites and so on today, that uh, believer's baptism is what counts, not the sprinkling of a baby. That might be a nice ceremony, if, if that's been meaningful to somebody. We did baby dedications with our baby. That's, that's nice to do things with the baby. Uh, but as far as conversion goes, uh, repentance is where conversion is found. And then baptism is a symbol of dying to the old self and rising anew with Christ by his merits and salvation. So thumbs up to those guys. I mentioned the Dutch. Uh, in Pennsylvania, uh, uh, another one like Plymouth Colony did a great job. Uh, Plymouth Colony was subsumed by the Puritans. Unfortunately, Massachusetts Bay was not the colony to go to if you weren't a Puritan. <laughs> uh, they persecuted uh, Roger Williams, for example. He was banished from the, co the colony because he had unorthodox uh, beliefs that, that theologically uh, didn't align with the Puritan authority. Um, they enforced their Puritan worship there, and even you'd be punished pretty, pretty badly there if you didn't align. Uh, but their model wasn't adopted by the Constitution. It was Roger Williams, Rhode Island, idea that the Founding Fathers took on 150 years later in 1787 at the Constitution. So that was just a few examples other than the, the Pilgrim colonists. But I hope you've enjoyed the history. It really does show prophecy in reverse, doesn't it? Uh, we just look back on it and we see the fulfillment and how God was leading his people. And we have nothing to fear about the future, lest we forget how God has led us in our past history. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your hand of providence that is so evident and we can just have confidence in you that you will lead us forward as you've led your people throughout the past. Thank you for blessing and making this day holy and thank you for blessing in us and making us holy in Christ. May his righteousness alone avail for our salvation as we seek him day by day, seek to be as courageous as those pilgrims were, as true to duty as those soldiers were in our post of, of, of warfare in this in this present age and we want to know that we have the spirit of Christ of, of toleration and love of our neighbor of all of humanity and give us a rebirth of that in our own hearts in Jesus name Amen <laughs>